Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salawatullahi wa salamu wa ala nabiyin al wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. We have a person who wants to embrace Islam. I don't know the story behind how he came to sit in this chair right now, but the important thing is that we're going to give him the shahada. And then after giving the shahada, we want to make a few very quick points, inshallah, before our lesson. At this point, his name is Mike. He doesn't have to change his name once he becomes a Muslim. So whoever's going to deal with him, inshallah, we advise you, take it easy and slow down and expose Islam to him gradually and expose the correct Islam to him. When a new revert wants to become a Muslim, we tell him, you have to change your name, you have to get a circumcision, you have to do this, you have to do that. And then he's overwhelmed with so many things. Keep it normal, easy, and simple. So Mike, who as you can see is a bit nervous, he asked me, are we going to say this in Arabic? No, we don't have to say it in Arabic. I don't know why it is that we think anytime someone embraces Islam, we have to give him the shahada in Arabic. Give him the shahada in the language that he understands. So you're going to repeat after me, Mike, okay? Very simply. You're going to say, I openly bear witness. I openly bear witness. That there is no God. That there is no God. Worthy of worship. Worthy of worship. Except Allah. Except Allah. And I openly bear witness. And I hope bear witness. Openly bear witness. Hopefully bear witness. That Muhammad. That Muhammad. The son of Abdullah. The son of Abdullah. Is the prophet of Allah. Is the Prophet of Allah and His Messenger, and His Messenger, and I bear witness, and I bear witness that Jesus, that Jesus is the Son of Maryam, is the Son of Maryam, and the Spirit from Allah, and the Spirit from Allah, Allah. and the Word that came from Allah, and the Word that came from Allah. So, with that, brothers, Mike is a Muslim. He is our brother. I, I, I just want to mention a few points very quickly. Um. First thing, we have quite a few people here, and I hope that you remember this issue. When people are around us and they want to embrace Al-Islam, then don't wait for the Imam Saab to come to the masjid or Fulan or Fulan. Don't wait for anybody to come to the masjid. You yourself give him dawah, and when he's ready to embrace Islam, you give him the shahada. You give him the shahada. Don't wait for anyone. Our religion is not a religion, although we respect scholars and we respect people who know. But our religion is not the type of religion where there are some special people walking around and they have some special favors. So why would you wait to give a man a shahada when you yourself can give him the shahada? You can give him the shahada. So in our religion, we have to do our best to try to do the righteous deeds as soon as possible. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, he told us that if you had a seed, you know, a seed that you plant and fruit grow from it, and Yom al-Qiyamah is about to be established, then hurry up and plant the seed so that you can get the reward based on your niyyah. Yom al-Qiyamah is about to be established. The sky is split and all these things are happening. You have a seed, hurry up and plant it. That's his way of telling us, hurry up and do the good deeds so that you can put it in your scales, the rewards that everyone is looking for. That's the first thing. Second thing is that Mike, he didn't embrace Islam until just now. People were teaching him how to pray. He prayed with us. He's not responsible for praying and doing anything else until he becomes a Muslim. From this point on, he has to pray. From this point on, we have to teach him the things that he needs to know. So it is really important, brothers in Al-Islam, that the basics of this religion, we come to understand them. When to do a wedding today, and at the wedding today, the Asian brother was marrying a girl who was a British lady, a white lady. I just took it for granted that she was a Christian. I just thought she was a Christian. But then in talking to her, she didn't have any religion. She was agnostic or atheist. She had no religion at all. So a person who wants to marry a lady who's not a Muslim, he has to know, is she from Ahl al-Kitab or not from Ahl al-Kitab? You can't just say because she's a white lady or just because she's a white lady, it's permissible to marry her. Now she has to become a Muslim or it's haram to marry her. 
she was a Sikh or a Hindu or other than a woman from Ahlul Kitab. Other than a woman from Ahlul Kitab. The third thing and the last thing is, it is really important and it is imperative, as we mentioned before, and as everyone knows, but this just serves as a reminder. The akhlaq of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it went a long way in giving dawah to non-Muslims, the way he acted, the way he was. Many people embraced al-Islam just based upon the way he was, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So this man, he came into our masjid. Many of us, we didn't even know that he was here. Uh, but he's looking at us. He's looking at us, as many of them do. They look at us when they come as our visitors, when they walk through the car park, when they see us as they're sitting on the side trying to drink their sorrows away. They see us. And... Our behavior towards them goes a long way in affecting non-Muslims how they view this religion, good or bad. How they, review, how they view Muslims, good or bad. So if we park the wrong way, they come and they see the way that we're parked and they curse us. If our children throw eggs at them and rocks at them while they're trying to drink their sorrows away, they curse us and they hate us. If we don't give them the right of the way and we don't make it easy for them to pass and so so on, we give bad uh, messages about Al-Islam. So we have to always remember, we have to always think there are people who are watching us and they are getting an idea about our religion based upon how we're behaving. So therefore, when we go to the toilet, Akramakum Allah, the way we leave our shoes, the way we respect people's clothes and we don't steal from them their, clothes, their mobile phones and their jackets and all of these kinds of things. Uh, I just want to remind myself and remind all of you of the importance of that aspect of the dawah. So we're happy that Mike has become our brother in Islam, a Muslim. Take your time, Mike, and be around people who know what they're doing. The brother right here is, I think, from Asia somewhere, right? It's from Africa, from Malawi. From Uganda. He's from Uganda. We have Asians, Arabs, whatever. Make sure you make a distinction between the culture of the people and the religion. You have to hold on to the religion of Islam and we'll do our best to help you out, inshallah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Barakallah fikum. Yeah, let me write this for him, okay? I'm going to give you my email address, okay, man? Yep, no problem. You have a piece of paper? You have an extra piece of paper, man? Hey, hey, hey. I'll give it to you on this thing right here. I think I have it right here. You have something? Oh, Mike. Anything you need, be just contact me. There you go. Yeah. Set up. Yusuf, are you alright? Um, just like a few books and bits and pieces and okay. CDs and stuff. And I put my contact details there until I phone them my email address. So if you ever want to get in touch, yeah, no problem. Um, I'll be able to look around and I'll be able to get in touch with you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Zero, zero, one, nine. And that's my number. Quick question, but I was asked by somebody else. You can stay. You don't have to disappear. I'm wrong with you. You go one sort of thing. No, inshallah, I'll answer that for you. No problem. Is there a simple? Is there a simple? 
Now I have to ask you more questions, find out right. what kind of home, what did the person hear, and things like that. Well, I, well, I was thinking well, I about showing an email you. Email me? Yeah, I should email you. Okay, yeah, that's good. No All right. Okay. Okay. So, take care of yourself. Mike, take care of yourself. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi na'hmadu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. May ahdi illah falamudinna lahu min yudlin falahari lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahduhu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadin abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam amma ba'du. Today inshallah ta'ala ya khwani we're going to shed some light on something of the life of one of the prophets of Islam that came to us in the Quran and his story was dealt with in further detail in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the story of one of the prophets of Islam who there are a lot of narrations concerning the details of his life but they have come to us in weak hadith or they have come to us in the hadith that have been narrated in the Isra'iliyat. And he is no other than the Nabi Ayyub salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. A Nabi who was mentioned in the Torah and he was mentioned in the Injil and he's been mentioned in the Quran as well. Ayyub. They call him in the Bible Job. J-O-B. And he is a Nabi who is well known for his sabr. The patience that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon him. Whenever we talk about Ayyub, this is from the fundamentals of the religion, from the asul of al-Islam, the asul of al-Iman. And that is because from the six arkan or the six pillars of faith is al-Iman in the, mala- in the, in the anbiya. We have to have belief, faith in the anbiya. And there are details how we have al-Iman in the anbiya. Al-Iman in the Anbiya constitutes that we believe that they're human beings, that they've been divinely inspired by Allah. Revelation came to them. They don't fall into the Kaba'ir. They are from the leaders of the Jannah. They are ma'sumun or infallible while they're prophets and so forth and so on. A lot of details. So it is from the arkan of al-iman. Allah Ta'ala mentioned him in a number of places in the Quran without getting in too much detail about his story. He said in the Quran to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna awhayna ilayka kama awhayna ila Nuhin wa nabiyyina min ba'dihi wa awhayna ila Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq wa Yaqub wa al-Asbaq wa Isa wa Ayyub. Verily we have revealed to you, Ya Muhammad, revelation. The same way we revealed revelation to Nuh. And we revealed revelation to the prophets after him. And then Allah mentioned some of those prophets who Al-Wahi came to them. From them is Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and the Asbat, the tribes of Bani Israel. Revelation came down to them. And we also revealed to Isa and to Ayyub. So his story was mentioned there. As I mentioned, he was a Nabi of Al-Islam who was tried with a serious trial. The Quran mentions his story very lightly, but the, Quran, the Sunnah goes into detail. And what was collected by Imam Ahmed, and other than Imam Ahmed, and Imam Al-Tabari and his tafsir, the chain narration as authentic, Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that there were two friends who were the good friends of Ayyub and all of the people abandoned him. Everybody who he knew, from those who were close to him and those who were far away from him, his relatives, everyone abandoned him, with the exception of his wife and these two friends of his. One of the friends said to the other friend, Rarely our brother, our friend Ayyub, he has committed a sin that no other human being has ever committed ever because look at his situation 
his other friends said, what's his problem? What's the situation? He said, Allah has tried Ayub and that he's been in this problem that he has for 18 years. That's what the authentic Sunnah said, that he had his fitna for 18 years. So we should put behind our backs and we shouldn't pay attention to the narrations that say 40 years, 70 years, because they come from the narrations of the Bible and the Israeliyat. The Prophet said that that man said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you not see that he has been in this fitna of 18 years? And what was his fitna? His fitna was that he had wealth and he had all kinds of wealth. He had paper money, he had gold, he had silver, he had a lot of children, he had animals, he had vegetation, he had land, he had every type of money and he was rich. Allah took all of those riches away from him and caused all of his family members as well to die or those who were extended family members to abandon him. And in addition to all of that, he was afflicted with leprosy. And Imam Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his book, Qasas Al-Anbiya, the story of the prophets, he said that Ayyub, it is said that Ayyub was the first human being that was afflicted with leprosy. Allah knows best. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not true, but that's what is said. And again, we tell you that leprosy is a disease that has a serious issue in our religion, a serious issue. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard about a leper, he used to protect himself and he would tell the leper, don't come here, don't come in our majlis, stay over there, we gave you the bayah from where you are, don't worry about it. And he told the community Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, firru min al-majdhum farārukum min al-asad. Run away from the leper the way you would escape and run away from a lion. Don't mess around with a person who has that kind of disease. It's the disease in which a person's meat actually starts to fall off of his body and it crumbles up. A terrible disease. And Ayub was afflicted with it and he was from the awliya of Allah. The friend said to the other friend, This catastrophe befell Ayub because of a sin that he committed. So when the other friend saw Ayub, he didn't have the ability to have sabr, to have patience. So he told Ayub what his friend said. Ayub said, La wallahi, that didn't happen. I didn't sin against Allah. Wallahi, I don't know what he's talking about. But what happened was, there were two men who used to argue. And when they were arguing, they were using Allah's name in vain. They were using Allah's name in the wrong way. And I didn't like for Allah's name to be used in the wrong way. So I went on my own and I paid money and made kafara. Someone says, Wallahi, I'm going to do this. Wallahi, I'm not going to do that. And then he doesn't do what he said Wallahi about. He should make kafara. So I you make kafara for the two men who are using Allah's name in vain. He said, I think this is why I have this problem. That's what he mentioned. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet went on to say that Ayyub's wife, she used to wait for him. Every time he would go and do whatever he had to do, she would wait for him. And then when he came, she would grab his hand and she would walk with him to the house or wherever they went. And one day, Ayyub took a long time coming for the wife, coming to the wife. So the wife went to look for Ayyub. When the wife went to look for Ayyub, Ayyub came. After some time, the wife came, the Messenger of Allah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she found Ayyub there, but he had been cured. He had been cured. And this aspect of his story has been mentioned in the Quran. This aspect of his story. Just this portion. Allah Ta'ala said to him in the Quran, Urqut birijlika hadha muhtasirun baridun wa sharab. Hit with this part of the ground, strike it with your foot, Ya Ya Ayyub. And there will gush forth a spring that will be cool for you to bathe in, and also it will be cool for you to drink. He hit it with his foot, the spring came as a miracle, bi idhnillah. He washed in it, and it took away his issue. The lady came, and she saw him. She said, have you seen the Nabi Ayyub? The one who has been tried? She said, because wallahi, when he was well and he had good health, I never saw anyone who resembled him like you resemble him. The man said, I am him. I am Ayub. I am that person. I am Ayub. That's the end of that particular hadith. 
In another hadith, the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after that happened, Allah Azza wa Jalla sent two clouds. One cloud went over a vessel that Ayyub had his wheat in. Another cloud went over a vessel that Ayyub had his barley in. And both clouds sent down money from the sky until both of those vessels were full and they started to overflow. We believe that those hadith in Fadail al-A'mal, the Fadail al-A'mal, we don't reject the hadith of Fadail al-A'mal just because they're in that book. We reject those hadith that mention things like this because the hadith are not authentic. They're not authentic. Similar to the story of the girl in Pakistan. And I don't know if you brothers have seen it on the YouTube where they went and did you see the Prophet's footprint? The size of an elephant? Did you see it? The Muslim who has education, he has any common sense, he doesn't believe in that nonsense. He doesn't believe in that. But he believes in mu'jizat, he believes in miracles, like this, what happened. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him back his wealth. He gave him back his wealth. And he also gave him back his family. As he mentioned in the number of ayat in the Qur'an. وَآيُوبَ إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الدُّرُّ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ And remember our slave Ayyub, when he called out to Allah, and he said in that dua with ikhlas and sincerity, verily I have been afflicted with that which hurts me and harms me. And you are the most merciful of those who have mercy. You, Allah, are arhamur rahimin. You are the most merciful. Allah Ta'ala mentioned, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ فَكَشَفْنَا مَا بِهِ مِنْ دُرْ وَعَتَيْنَاهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمَعْهُ مِثْلُهُمْ رَحْمَةٍ مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَذِكْرَ لِلْعَابِدِينَ because of that dua that he made, Allah Ta'ala said, we gave him back his family and we doubled it. So all of the children that he had previously, we gave him more children. We did, did, did this form as a rahmah from us and also as a, a remembrance for those who are the worshippers of Allah. It is a dhikr, a reminder, an example, a lesson for those people who worship Allah. Allah. So Allah Ta'ala gave him back all of his wealth and gave him back his wife and his children as well. In addition to that, in an authentic hadith, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Ayyub was taking a bath and he was naked. Akramakumullah. He was taking a bath in the water and he was naked. And while he was taking a bath, some golden grasshoppers came. And they started jumping and bouncing around and hopping around in his presence. Ayub took his thobe and he was gathering up those golden grasshoppers made out of gold. They were gold, mu'jiza from Allah. And Allah Ta'ala said to him, Ya Ayub, Amma agnayta kan hadha? Didn't I not give you enough money already after I cured you? Didn't I give you enough money where you don't need these grasshoppers? Ayyub said, yes, my Lord, you have given me enough, but I'm still in need of your rahmah. I'm still in need of your rahmah. Those are the ayat, ikhwani, and the ahadith, or some of the ayat, and the ahadith that are established about Ayyub, that are established about Ayyub. And there are a few things we want to mention to you and to remind you of concerning this issue. First of which is... The Prophet he told us sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam that a man is tried in accordance to the level of his religion. If he has a strong religion, then Allah will try him accordingly. He said sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam inna ashadda nas balaina l'anbiya thumma salihoon thumma al-amthal fal-amthal yuktala al-raju ala hasab dinihi in kana fi dini salaba a man, those people get the most difficult and the toughest ibtila are the anbiya. And then after them, the religious people, the salihun. And then the people get tested according to their level after that. He said if a man's religion is strong, then he will be tested accordingly. And if his religion is strong, it will be increased, his bala. So the fitna that people have, especially if they are religious people, they should never give up about the fact that this thing is not going to end. Ayyub, salawatullahi wa salam, he went through his ibtila for eight 
15 years. And there's something that's very important that we have to look at that comes out here. Sometimes we go through fitna because we make bad decisions and bad moves. But sometimes Allah Ta'ala, He just tries a person. Like Ayyub, He didn't do anything. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to be tried. And his trials and tribulations were greater than Ayyub. Because he's a greater Nabi than Ayyub. He's a greater prophet than Ayyub. A greater person than Ayyub. He says Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam, Ma udhiya. Ahadu mithlu ma uditu. No one has had the problems or the other. His people talking bad about him and against him and bothering him and trying to kill him and harm him. He said, no one had to deal with what I had to deal with. So his trials and tribulations were great. Although, he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. So the point here is, that an individual can get a child, a fitna from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that fitna comes simply as a test from Allah to see if the person really truly believes. Or if he just says with his tongue that he believes. But he doesn't really have an iman in his heart. Which brings us to the other issue. There are those people who practice al-Islam. Especially the ones who connect themselves to groups. And other than them. Many times we think that we're on the haq because of the trial that Allah has given us. In the 60s and the 70s, some of the jama'at of the Muslims, especially like in Egypt, like in Syria, they used to do certain things that would get them in trouble. The wrath of the oppressive regimes would come down on them. And they would start arresting people and putting them in prison. And chopping their heads off. And the people of those groups would say things like, This is because our religion is strong, and this is because we're on the haq. A Muslim can't have al ghurur like that about himself. He can't think like that. It's possible that you're being tested because of something about you holding on to your religion. But if a person is not practicing the religion the correct way, and he creates for himself unnecessary problems, that fitna that he thinks is a test, it can just be a punishment that Allah has put on him as a result of what his hands put forth. So we have to make the distinction and the person has to evaluate himself. The problems that we have, we have to look at them and put them in perspective. We have to say, why did this thing get created? Is it because I opened up the door for it? I'm the one who decided to marry that lady. And I saw all of the telltale signs that indicated, don't marry her. There are going to be problems. If you can be honest with yourself and you look back and you reflect retrospectively, you say, yes, this fitness is a result of what I put myself through. I opened up the door. So I made the bed. Now I have to lie in the bed. Can't blame anyone else for my situation. But if a person looks at himself and he sees for the most part he's trying to practice, he can't really think or remember something that he did that warrants such an issue, perchance, it may be, it may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just trying him, but you never really know unless you're from the prophets and the messengers. The point is, don't have ghulu in any direction. Also from the benefit of this story of Ayyub salawatullahi wa sallam wa alayhi is from the keys that Allah has given us to get out of our problems is the key of a dua the key of dua Ayyub as we mentioned a few weeks ago he had the sabr that is the sabr jameel so I want to ask someone here what is the sabrun jameel khwani Abu Umar sabrun jameel I think you were working that night because you work at night you weren't here does anyone know what sabrun jameel is Akhi Abdul Majid. That's a condition of Sabrun Jameel. What is the Sabrun Jameel that Allah commanded us with in the Quran? Fasbir Sabrun Jameela. He told the Prophet that have the beautiful Sabr. The Sabr that Yaqub Salawatullahi was salam alayhi he said, Bal sawwalat lakum and fusakum amra fa sabrun jameel. I'm going to have sabr jameel. What is sabr jameel? That was mentioned in these two ayahs of the Quran. Adil. (laughs) 
Ikhwani, sabrun jameel, as the brother mentioned, is the highest level of sabr, and it is the sabr that a person has in which he doesn't complain to the people about it. He has a problem and he doesn't complain to the people. He just deals with it between him and Allah. He calls on Allah like Ayub did in this ayah. Like Yaqub did, the one who said he's going to have sabrun jameel. He said, "Nama ashku bathi wa huzni ila Allah wa a'lamu min Allahi ma la ta'lamun. I complain about my sorrow and I complain about my, my, my sadness only to Allah. I don't go around complaining to the people. Allah described the fuqara and the masakeen of the Muslims, the ones who have sabr jameel, the fuqara of the Muslims. He said in the Quran, يَحْسَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُ أَغْنِيَاءً مِنَ التَّعَفُّفِ تَعْرِفُ سِيمَاهُمْ لَا يَسْأَلُونَ النَّاسَ إِلْحَافَةً The one who doesn't know them, he doesn't know that this man right here, he doesn't know his situation, he's not from Birmingham. So the man came from London, he doesn't know, this man sitting in our masjid is miskeen, he doesn't know him. And because he doesn't know him, he thinks that the man has a lot of money. He thinks he's from the Agniya because he doesn't go around asking people indiscriminately. He just is patient with his situation. But because we know him, we know him. We know that he's miskeen. We know that he's fakir. We know his condition. But an outsider, when he comes, he doesn't know because the man doesn't complain. That's sabrun jameel that the prophets had. Whereas some of us, again, when we have a problem, if you come and you sit with your friends and your friends say, how are you doing? You say, oh, oh, my mother wants money back in Somalia. I have to take care of my sister. I got my own bills. I have my own problems. Oh, and then we can't tolerate all of that kalam. So we get up and we leave. He leaves and he gets on the bus. And the bus driver says, put your money in a pound, 70 pence. And how you been? Oh, yeah, I have all of these problems and my wife and this and that. And he doesn't know the man and the man doesn't know him. That's not sabrun jameel. To always go around complaining to people like that. Because people are not going to help you. You'll give them fire and ammunition to make your situation kalam. They'll talk about your situation. And in addition to that, in addition to that, they'll look at you as being a person who you're not mature, you're not responsible. Don't go around indiscriminately sharing your personal problems and affairs with other people. If you share it with other people, they're going to share it with other people. Except those people who are close to you and you've dealt with them. And that's one of the benefits of sabr. That when you take your time, you get to know your companions. You take your time, you get to know which companion you can talk to and which you can't talk to. Which one you can loan money to, which one you can't loan money to, and so forth and so on. So that's the sabrun jameel. Ayub, from the benefits of this issue, is that from the keys that Allah Ta'ala has given us to get out of our problems, and they are many, many keys, is the key of a dua person has a problem, then let him make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As he made dua using the names of Allah and his characteristics that Allah is the most merciful of those who have mercy. As a result of that dua that he made using the names and the attributes of Allah, we got him out of his problem and we helped him out of his problem. In addition to that, Ikhwani al-Imam al-Bukhari, that hadith of the golden grasshoppers, he used that as a delil to refute one of the madhabs that he refused throughout his book. He refused a particular madhab throughout his book. And he used this hadith to prove and to show that it is permissible for prophets and all other human beings to take their clothes off in order to take a ghusl or other than that, in order to wash the body of an individual, the sheikh or other than that, it's permissible for the individual in our religion to take his clothes off in order to take a ghusl. And that doesn't take away from his status and his stature because you can't take a ghusl properly with your clothes on. And that aspect of the jarad as well or the grasshopper goes to show that no one, ikhwani, is beyond Receiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah and beyond receiving the 
the virtues that Allah bestows upon people. This is one of the main hadith that the scholars of the Sunnah use to refute the people of a Sufiya who have the opinion there was a certain type of Sufi where they didn't partake in the dunya and they were subtracted and they were away from the dunya and they felt and they thought that the dunya was something that was inherently evil and you should avoid it altogether. Although this Nabi of Al-Islam, Ayyub, he said, I am in need of your rahmah, I'm in need of your virtues. The Prophet of Al-Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he also used what he can use from the dunya to help the Muslims, to help the ummah, to help his family, and other than that. And Allah revealed in the Quran, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ dunya. Don't forget your portion of the dunya. Don't forget your portion of the dunya. Get educated. Position yourself to make money, to be able to take care of yourself, take care of your community, take care of your family, and other than that. But the problem with the dunya is going overboard and trying to accumulate it, or going overboard and not recognizing what has been put here for, or a person digging his nails into the dunya, thinking that the dunya is the goal and the objective. So that is the story of Ayyub in a nutshell. We're going to do some of more of the stories of the NBA of Al-Islam. We started off with Ayyub because his story is very simple and very easy. So if you brothers have any questions concerning that issue, you can put your question forward. Akhi Nihad. He make a kafara. If a person does a sin and he says, Wallahi, 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 I'm not going to visit him anymore. Wallahi, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to visit. I won't eat this meal anymore. Wallahi. Then he should play for his breaking his Amen for the hymn. So he prays in order to free himself from that thing that he did. So he heard those two men using Allah's name in vain, arguing, saying, Wallahi, this, Wallahi, that. So he himself went and paid the money for them, although he didn't have to. He went to get his own reward as if to get closer to Allah by saying, I respect your name so much, I love your name so much, I'm paying on behalf of these two men. Any more questions, Akhwani? Yusuf, you had your hand up? Any more? It doesn't sound like it's something authentic because the Quran didn't mention that to us and the Sunnah didn't mention that to us. As a matter of fact, the Quran goes against that. Like the ayat that we just mentioned. That he said to Allah, I have been touched by harm. In Surah Al-Anbiya, Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah Ta'ala mentioned, وَذْكُرْ عَبْدِنَا أَيُّوبِ إِذْ نَادَ رَبُّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِي الشَّيْطَانُ بِنُصْبٍ وَعَذَابٍ and remember our slave Ayyub when he cried out and said, I have been touched by this shaitan. Shaitan has been put on me difficulty and he has punished me. He has put me in nusbun as difficult, make things difficult for me, and he's put adab upon me. So that dua is from Ayyub. And there's nothing to suggest someone said, do this dua Ayyub. So it sounds like it's something that is not authentic. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of things about Ayyub that have been attributed to him, but they come from the Israeliyat. Akhi Abdul Majid. Are there any reasons why we are prohibited from being close to lepers? Lepers? Yes, yes, yes. The reason why we're prohibited from being close to lepers is that it is a disease that is contagious, bi It is contagious. Bi'idhnillah. If Allah wants it to be transported from one person to another, then it will happen. And it's a highly contagious disease, so it should be avoided. Highly contagious disease. And then there's the hadith ikhwani that we took in this masjid from Kitab al Tawheed about the issue of the authentic hadith. Where the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La Tayyara wa La Adwa. He said, There should be no superstition. 
where you say if the bird goes that way, I'll do it. If the bird goes that way, I won't do it. If you see a white bird, you say it's a good omen. If you see a crow or a black bird, you say a bad omen. Don't make decisions based upon that. Don't be optimistic or pessimistic about these kind of affairs. Ever. That's not the aqidah of al-Islam. And in the hadith he said, there is no adwa, which means this disease being contagious. He said, there's no contagious diseases. Yeah, but why did he say to run away from the leper if there's no contagious disease? What he meant by that is that the disease itself doesn't have the ability to come and jump on you. The disease itself doesn't have the ability to jump on you. Right now, in our majlis, someone has a cold. Someone has a cold. He's sitting with us and he has a cold. You don't catch that cold. But someone else catches that same cold. Because it's Allah who determines whether or not the cold is going to be caught by someone else and whether it can move. That's the meaning of that particular hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Imam Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani wrote a book called Kitab al-Ta'oon, the book of what do you call it, Ta'oon? What is it? Epidemic, epidemic. And there's the hadith where the Prophet told us, if you're in a place or you're going to the place and it's there, don't go in. And if you're in there and the disease came, don't go out. So that goes to show us that there's that disease is contagious. Insha'Allah, if Allah wants it to be contagious, but the disease by itself cannot do anything. The disease by itself. Sheikh, before that other brother put his finger up, was asked a question and Khwani doesn't have, we'll come back to that because it doesn't have anything to do with the dars. Go ahead, Sheikh. Concerning how much you have to pay for the kafara, khwani, that's a dars we have to give by itself. Something that requires preparation. I don't want to talk here just like that from my head. So we'll do a class exclusively on Al-Ayman, the kafarat of the Ayman. We'll do a class specifically on that so we all can get some fiqh and comprehension about it with the dalil and the proof. When you say, Wallahi, when do you have to pay when you don't have to pay? Every time you say, Wallahi, Wallahi, and you don't do that thing, do you have to pay? Yes or no? So we'll do a proper class where it's been prepared so that we can deliver it in a way where we'll be supporting what we're saying and establishing our religion and what we believe in and what we're going to do with clear evidences. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Okay, then we'll end with the question that the brother had that was off of the subject. There is a hadith, and it is authentic. The Prophet says, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, La yathul jannata ibnu zangatan. The person who is the son or the result of zina, he won't enter into the jannah. La yathul jannata ibnu zangatan. If a girl or a boy, a person was born out of wedlock, the parents were not married. The hadith said, he will not enter into the Jannah. So the brother read that hadith. He wants to know, is that authentic? It's hadith that's authentic. It's sahih. It's authentic. No doubt about it. Then how can that be? A person, his mother and his father were not married. What did he have to do with that crime? Why is he being held accountable for it? That's something closer to Christianity than it is to the deen of Al-Islam. When Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran... لا تزر وازر لا تزر وازر وزر أخرى لا تزر وازرة وزر أخرى No one will be held accountable for the burden of somebody else. So why would this child or this person who is mother and the father made zina, why would he not go to Jannah? Anybody want to try? Anybody want to explain that? Anyone? Anyone? Want to make ijtihad? Fadl ya akhi. The person who is an illegitimate child, a child of zina, won't go into the jannah. 
He won't go into the Jannah. Won't go into paradise. Akhuna, Yusuf. There's another hadith that says, Waladu Zina Asharru Lithneen. The child of the Zina is the worst of the two. There's some maqal, some issue in that hadith. The one that is authentic is, Waladu Zina Asharru Thalatha. The child of Zina is the worst of the three. The child of the Zina is the worst of the three. This is not it. Anyway, Akhwani. The meaning of the person of the zina is the worst of the three means if he does what his mother and his father were doing, then he's worse than they are because he should have known from what they were doing, the problems that are between them and in his life and so forth and so on. The way people are looking at him, he's a what a zina and all that. So if he grew up to make zina, he's worse than his mother and his father in terms of his behavior. The meaning of the child of zina won't enter into the jannah, it doesn't mean that the one who is a child and the result of zina won't enter into jannah. Wallahi, the person who is the child of zina can enter into the jannah and will enter into the jannah if they say la ilaha illallah. And they may go into the jannah and they may be from the awliya of Allah. The meaning of the hadith is that the walid zina or ibn zina, that's one of the things that the Arabs say in their language. Like a person is Ibn Sabil. Ibn Sabil. Do you know who the Ibn Sabil is? He's the wayfarer, the one who's lost. He's in Birmingham trying to get back to his country and he doesn't have money. He's called the son of the road. But he's not the son of the road. The road is not his father. But they call him that in the Arabic language, in the Quran. Ibn Sabil, the son of the road. A person who loves the dunya. They call him Ibn Dunya. Ibn Dunya, the one who loves the dunya. For an example, the Prophet, when he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the child of Zina, it means that the one who always commits Zina, the person, this is who he is and how he is. All he ever does is Zina, 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 Zina. All the time, he's making Zina. That's what he does all the time. Then this is the one who won't enter into the Jannah, meaning, the one who commits zina, zina is an issue that won't allow you to get into Jannah. But the child who came as a result of zina, if he practices religion, he doesn't have anything to do with what his parents did. Islam doesn't hold him accountable for that. And Allah, he is Allah and Alam. Okay, Khwani, Tuesday, there's not going to be any class this Tuesday coming up, inshallah. The next class is going to be next Sunday. So if you come Wednesday, Tuesday for the Salat, inshallah, please make the announcement that there won't be a class for this Tuesday. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in.